Can we create social change without money? I don't know the answer to that conclusively, but I think if we just hold that question, it raises some very interesting insights. Since we're talking about money, I thought I'd start with a story on Wall Street. One of my friends was running a venture fund, had a great year. His boss calls him in, says, congratulations, what do you want? This metaphorical, proverbial blank check. He asks for something radical. He looks his boss in the eye and he says, what I want is a minute of silence before all our group meetings. The boss is saying, wow, we are in a context where we bill every three minutes. You want a minute of silence to do nothing? I mean, that's like wasting time. It's like, no. Anything else? Boss looks, he's like, no, this, that's all I really want. Boss goes to sleep, comes back the next day, and he says, uh, you know what? If really that's all you want, I'll fine, I'll give it to you. Gives him that minute of silence. That minute turns to two, to three, to five. Now they do 30 minutes once a week, and they even have their own meditation bell. What was this guy thinking? What was my friend thinking? On one side, he had money. On the other side, he had a very different kind of resource. He is saying, I don't want to meet people in a space of rush. I want to meet them with a little bit of quiet. It changed his relationship to himself. It changed his relationship to other people. And it changed his relationship, certainly, with his boss. But it wasn't just him. It actually started how, it actually changed how everyone related to each other. It changed the whole culture of that space. And that was something he valued more than the financial capital. So how do we broaden our lens to look at alternative forms of capital? This is, this is a question, I think this is a possibility that we all have access to, but in our current world today, we're very biased towards the financial. In theory, our society is supposed to regulate itself with all these things. We have three big sectors. Right? We have the private sector, which is rooted in extrinsic motivations, money, power, fame. And then we have the voluntary sector, which is the opposite of that, rooted in very intrinsic sort of motivations, compassion, knowledge, purpose. And then there's the public sector, which is supposed to regulate between the two and work on both sides of the aisle. This is how it's supposed to work in theory. In practice, though, it's the big private sector. It starts to take over, starts to dominate. We do have a public sector, but the public sector is increasingly being controlled by the private sector. And there is that little voluntary sector, which you see over there, but even now, in the name of the sharing economy, even that is being commoditized. So when we look at everything, here you see that your lawnmower is six bucks a day, that Hermes purse you can rent out for $100 a party, right? your dog, $5 a walk. What, when, we start to, when we have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. If money is the only metric we have, then we start to put price tags on everything. And the problem with price tags is that we start to lose connection with the price less. We start to lose connection with our intrinsic motivation. So what does science say about all this? Edward Desi at University of Rochester has been studying this for 40 years. He's been studying incentives for 40 years. Thousands and thousands of experiments. And he basically says that the carrot and stick model doesn't work. This idea of a contingent reward, if you do this, then you will get this, doesn't actually work in practice. He, for example, he looked at people who loved to solve puzzles. And they would just love to do it just purely for, for the enjoyment of it. Then he started to pay them to do the same thing. And then at a later point, he stopped paying them. As soon as he stopped paying them, you would think they would return to that original state, right? But they actually were no longer interested in solving puzzles at all. What, what he's showing is that money desensitizes us. What science is telling us is actually, don't show me the money. When you're working with intrinsic motivations, do not show me the money. At Max Planck uh, Institute, they've been studying 18-month-olds. These 18-month-olds are you know, just playing, and all of a sudden they see a bunch of strangers that are putting clothes. They're putting clothes up for drying. There's a clothespin, and the clothespin drops and they can't get it, so this 18-month-olds, these little toddlers, see that a person is in need, immediately go out to help. They pick it up and they offer it. They haven't been taught kindness or compassion, but they're still moved to help. They're still moved to cooperate. So what science is telling us is that it's natural that we're wired to care. In fact, not only don't show me the money, let's not show any rewards, this is not necessary. We have many examples of people 
who lead with these intrinsic motivations, but the question is, what designs emerge when we don't lead with money? What, mo what designs emerge when we lead with something subtler, something internal? Mother Teresa, of course, is an example that all of us, all of us know about, someone purely motivated by these intrinsic motivations. This is my friend Lynn Twist. She's a world-famous fundraiser, author of a book, Soul of Money. She knows about money. She had an interesting conversation with Mother Teresa. She knew her personally. And she says, Mother Teresa, what's your fundraising strategy? Mother Teresa, with this big compassion, says, oh, I just pray. Whatever I get is what I need. It was simple. Here was a woman who had 400 centers in 102 countries, and she's kind of like the CEO of this whole thing, and she is saying, I have no fundraising strategy. Or rather, she's saying, my fundraising strategy is to be rooted in intrinsic motivation so deeply that external security is not even a concern. And we have many modern examples as well. Linux rivaled Microsoft Windows purely with a distributed army of volunteers. Wikipedia did that with Encyclopedia Britannica. On Wikipedia alone, through those micro edits that everybody does, 100 million volunteers hours have been donated. Couchsurfing allowed strangers to stay on each other's couches. So we have this whole spectrum of intrinsic motivations, of extrinsic motivations on one side, going all the way to intrinsic motivations. Right? You go from money, power, fame, but then you go to fun and learning and growth and purpose. And then on the far right, you also have these very deep things like healing and inner transformation and ultimately compassion. On, our, on that side of the spectrum, we have many examples. Right? We're thousands and thousands, but on the other side, on the side of intrinsic motivations, we don't have too many. There are some, right? Alcoholics Anonymous, decentralized, distributed, never monetized. And we wanted to create a greater possibility on that side of the spectrum. So back in 1999, we started Service Space. We were building websites for nonprofits. It started with four of us. But really, underneath that, what we wanted to do was anchor ourselves in these internal motivations, right? in the spirit of this inner transformation, which for us was very, very profound and very meaningful. So we decided to anchor our work over the last 16 years. It's been anchored in these three principles that we haven't compromised. First one is that we're always going to be volunteer run. And so a lot of people look at that and, well, wow, that's like scarcity of staff. How can you do this? How, can you, how will you scale and whatnot? What we noticed was actually we had an abundance of social capital. Imagine you got to raise a million bucks. You could do it from one or two people. But if you had a dollar from a million people, everyone saying, yes, I believe in what you're doing. Yes, I care. The energy of that is profound, right? It's powerful. And that's kind of what we are experiencing with time. Similarly, we had a second principle to not fundraise. Now, when you don't fundraise, you have to work with what you got. Right? And you start to have a lot of gratitude for whatever you do receive. And you start to cooperate. There's these incredible synergies that happen because you're working with different kind of resources. And we decided to focus on small. It wasn't about big things outside. It was about being the change you wish to see in the world. And as soon as you do that, you start to tune into the subtle. And that subtle starts to make you aware in a very deep way of our interconnection. So service space was doing a lot of these things. How far can you push yourself when you're anchored so deeply into the inner transformation world, into these intrinsic motivations? We started building websites. We ended up helping thousands of nonprofits come online. Then we started doing, building these. We said, the world needs a little bit more inspiration, inspiring content. We started portals like Daily Good and KarmaTube. Right? Every year, we send 70 million emails. None of them have an ad. We started this game of kindness called Smile Cards, and it went super viral over 100 countries. In local communities, we started these gift economy experiments like Karma Kitchen, where people are redefining what it means to engage in transaction. In living rooms around the world, we started these awaken circles, which take living rooms and build community. All of this, now more than half a million members, was rooted was all accomplished and rooted in these intrinsic, in, intrinsic motivations without raising a single penny. So it's not just that you can do a lot with this. It actually changes the way in which you relate to each other. This is a photo of, of Karma Kitchen. 
Now you walk into Karma Kitchen, and when people are just giving for the love of it, it changes the way, it, it changes how you interact with each other in that collective space. At Karma Kitchen, you walk in, it's like a regular restaurant, you have your meal, but the check at the end of the meal reads zero. It's zero because someone before you has paid for you, and you get to pay forward for somebody after you. You are trusted to pay forward whatever you want. Now, it's a profound idea, and it worked like wonders. Now it's in 17 places around the world. So it's, it was working like a charm. But what works is not the intellectual idea, it's actually the experience. It's actually realizing when you walk in, the greeter is a volunteer, the person who is waiting on your table, the person who plates your food, the person who is bussing your tables. They're all volunteers. And that guy in the back who signed up six hours to be on his feet, to just do everybody's dishes so you can have an experience of generosity is also a volunteer. And when you realize this, it begets a very different kind of generosity in you. A very deeper kind of compassion flows through you, and you want to be like that. It's very natural. This woman, Mina Jung, volunteered. She was going to Berkeley. Uh, she was doing her undergrad at Berkeley. And she was so moved by this, she says, I need to study this. She did her PhD studying the gift economy, studying Karma Kitchen and such examples. Hadn't been done before with eight different experiments. And sure enough, she showed that actually, when, when you are kind, if you create a strong context, people respond to generosity with even greater generosity. In fact, the title of her paper was called Paying More When Paying for Others. This is Richard Whitaker. He runs his art magazine in the same way. He was running it for 15 years in this way. Then he runs across service space, and he says, wow, this is great. This is what I want to do. He offers refunds to all his current subscribers, and he says, from now on, only offerings of gratitude. This is Twi Win. She runs her acupuncture clinic in this way. And I want to end with this story of one of my friends, Uday Bhai. He's a rickshaw driver. By all, you know, by all metrics, he, he would probably be one of these, he would be a UN statistic on, on one of those poverty charts. He's a rickshaw driver, he's a humble rickshaw driver, but he has another kind of resource. He believes in love, he believes in people. So he decided to run his rickshaw on a pay it forward basis. You sit in his rickshaw, no meters. Someone before you has paid for you, and you get to pay forward for people after you, whatever you want. He trusted that goodness in people. Everyone, of course, was, this was in the sixth largest city in India, and so everyone clearly was like, oh, does it work? How does it work? What are you doing? And you're like a rickshaw driver. How can you do this? And he says, here, I've got a ledger. Everyone was going to ask him, so he would keep track. He would say point A to point B, point B to point C. Yes, some pay more, some pay less. On the whole, it evens out. But he says, let me show you another notebook. This is where I ask people to write down how they felt sitting in my rickshaw. And imagine completely being got caught off guard by the generosity and compassion of this one rickshaw driver. It, it moves people to tears. People take vows for life. It's just deeply transformative. And you can see that in all these notes. So how Uday Bhai certainly changed the world. He didn't have money, but he had a deeper kind of resource. And through that resource, through his belief in our innate generosity, he actually created a massive ripple that is indeed changing the world. But Udebai is redefining what it means to have capital. He's diversifying that portfolio of wealth. He is saying, and when you do that, he, what you really start saying yes to is saying, it's no longer about the CEO, it's about the everyday Joe. It's no longer about fundraising, it's about friend raising. It's no longer about price tags, it's about the price less. And all of this sits on this single idea that what we will do for love will always be greater than what we do for money. May we all lead with love and change the world. Thank you.